Welcome to episode 6 of Solo Challenges with Baby Pokemon in Crystal Version. Following up Magby, Smoochum, and Alekid, today I'm going to be beating the game with Cleffa. If you haven't seen any of the other episodes in this series, I highly recommend checking them out. Do know that there will be spoilers for all of those videos in this one. So now, let's get into it. Examining the base stat totals of all of the baby Pokemon, we can see that Cleffa has slightly less than Togepi, and just slightly more than both Tyrogue and Igglybuff, and uh, not that much more than Pichu, so overall this thing is very weak. At least it's really cute. Like, look at it. This has to be one of the most adorable Pokemon in the game. That being said, in my videos, we are all about objective data. We don't care about subjective things like cuteness. So let's break Cleffa down and see what potential it really has for a solo playthrough. By the way, the rules that I play by are in the description, so check them out if you don't already know. For base stats, Cleffa has 50 HP, 25 attack, 28 defense. 45 special attack, 55 special defense, and 15 speed. So it is a slow special attacker with good special defense, and on the physical side of things it really doesn't have a lot going for it. That's unfortunate because in generations 1 to 3, the normal type deals physical damage, so I'm going to be using my attack stat for same type moves. If you're somehow one of the viewers that is coming here from a later generation, you might be like, but wait, Cleffa is a fairy type. No, 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 fairy type was introduced in generation 6, this is generation 2, Cleffa is a normal type. That being said, I think if they had introduced fairy alongside dark and steel, it probably would have been a special type, and that would have made Cleffa a lot better in these games. However, it's not that bad because it has a quite diverse move pool. When I ranked all the baby Pokemon move pools, I put Cleffa in third place in the B tier. It is ahead of the two other normal types, Igglybuff and Togepi, and even ahead of Smoochum. After all, that thing doesn't get a lot of coverage, but Cleffa really does. As a starting set, it gets Pound, Charm, and Encore. They actually synergize quite well together, although Encore is not particularly useful in a solo playthrough. Then through level up, it only gets two moves, Sing and Sweet Kiss, and both of those are actually going to have a decent amount of utility. While I don't really like using Sing due to its 55% accuracy, when a baby Pokemon is what I'm running, this move can actually have good utility. Beyond that, through TMs, HMs, and the Move Tutor, it gains access to two of the three primary normal type moves, in this case Return and Headbutt, but it doesn't learn Swift. And then it gets fantastic coverage. Rollout, Icy Wind, Solar Beam, Iron Tail, Psychic Shadow Ball, Mud Slap, Rip Gligar, Fire Blast, and Flamethrower. The biggest differentiator here between it and Togepi is the fact that it learns Icy Wind where Togepi didn't. And I'm not sure you're aware, but ice moves in Generation 2 are absolutely fantastic. There are two major battles featuring Dragon type trainers, and after Price's badge you get an ice type damage boost, as well as a boost to your special attack. Plus, using special attacks is going to be what Cleffa wants to do. Unfortunately for me, it's going to take a little while before I get one, because in the earliest portions of the game, I am going to be all physical. For this challenge, the rival's going to be picking Chikorita. I don't have any problems against him in the first battle. And with that, I am off towards Violet City. One advantage that a normal type has is the fact that Faulkner doesn't have any type advantage against me, meaning he is going to choose the move that does the most damage. In this case, the Pidgey is going to be doing more damage with Tackle instead of Mud Slap, so I'm not going to have my accuracy lowered, and then the Pidgeotto is going to be prioritizing Gust. After reaching Violet City, I wanted to take on Faulkner right away. However, the first Bird Keeper takes Cleffa down to Orange Health, and then the second Bird Keeper with two Pidgeys almost finishes me off, so fighting Faulkner now is definitely not the right choice. Instead, I'm going to head to Sprout Tower. But before I do that, I head out onto Route 36, where I can talk to Arthur and pick up the Hardstone. I'm getting this now because I don't want to forget it, and also Rollout could be a good option for Whitney if I'm not doing enough damage with my other moves. In Sprout Tower, I can gain some experience by defeating all the Bell Sprouts in here. By the way, as a kid, I always found it really weird that most of the Pokemon here are level 3. On the top floor, they do get a big level boost to 6, but still, they are not a challenge. So with all the trainers in the early game defeated, I can't delay facing Faulkner any longer. Hey, that's a rhyme. <laughs> His first Pokemon is Pidgey, and I am really hoping that Pound is able to two-hit. Unfortunately, it looks like it does just less than half. 
but yes, that is confirmed with my second pound, which takes it down to red health. However, the Pidgey isn't doing very much to me, and I finish it off. Next is Pidgeotto, which crits right away. However, it isn't doing that much. I figured here I could reduce its damage by using Charm twice to give it minus four attack. Then, because I'm holding a berry, I should be able to survive long enough to take it out using Pound. This strategy ends up working out very well. The Pidgeotto only takes me down to half health by the time I finish it off. And with that, I have earned myself the first badge, a 12.5% boost to my attack stat, as well as the TM for Mudslap, which in this case I teach right away in the place of Sing. I'm going to talk about that choice later on in the video in depth. For now, I will explain my reasoning in this first playthrough. I essentially just wanted to overwrite Sing so that I wouldn't be seduced into using it throughout the run, because I tend to over-rely on sleep tactics, and when you have one that is this in inaccurate, the whole playthrough can suffer if I get tunnel vision thinking I have to solve an opponent with it. You might think that Encore is the more obvious choice to delete, and yes, I would agree with you now. That being said, I was thinking that I could maybe use it to trap Bugsy's Scyther in Quick Attack instead of Fury Cutter, and potentially Whitney's Mill Tank in a move like Stomp or maybe Milk Drink. Now while I've been explaining all that, you'll notice that I am walking back towards New Bark Town. Um, why would I do this? Well, the answer is, if you head back to the very first route of the game, you can find this lady in red on Tuesdays and talk to her, and she will give you the pink bow which boosts the damage of normal type moves. With Cleffa, I figured that its low attack stat meant that I should pick up this item as fast as is possible in order to get better damage ranges in the subsequent sections of the game. If you're confused why I didn't just pick this up on my way through this area in the first place, she only appears after you defeat Faulkner, so the fastest way you can get this item is backtracking like I did. In Union Cave, I use Mudslap to defeat the rock types. Once again, I'm training on pretty much every trainer just to gain as much experience as is possible. Sadly, as I said before, Cleffa does not gain access to Swift, but once it makes it out of the tunnel, I am level 18, which is pretty good. By the way, Cleffa has a fast growth rate, which if you didn't know is the second best growth rate in the early game. Despite seeming like it should be the best growth rate, it actually levels up slower than the medium slow growth rate until level 30. So Cleffa is a little bit slower in the early game, but overall I think this is the best growth rate for a baby Pokemon to have, just because of how much it improves the level up rate in the mid to late game. Next I head into Slowpoke Well, and here I want to mention the fact that Cleffa is actually having to return to the Pokemon Center fairly frequently. The reason is I'm just not outputting that much damage right now, and as a result the opponent gets more turns in battle, meaning that my health gets negatively impacted, and I don't want to buy a lot of healing items. After all, I had problems with Jasmine when I was using Togepi, and I'm thinking for this run that I really need to save as much money as is possible so that I can gain access to Fire Blast fairly quickly in the playthrough. The final rocket in here has a level 14 coughing. I go for Mudslap against it because it's super effective, and it's also going to lower his accuracy. Unfortunately, the coughing hits with Smog, which poisons right away. Now this would be much worse if Cleffa was a fairy type, so maybe I'm going to walk back that statement I made at the beginning of the video. This whole playthrough might be more difficult as a fairy type. In the future, I'm sure that I'll backport the type and test it out in these games, but for now, we will just have to wonder. I do manage to pull through this fight on red health, and with that, I'm headed into Bugsy's gym to fight all the trainers here. With them out of the way, now it's time to take him on. His two lead Pokemon are pretty bad, Metapod and Kakuna. The only downside to facing both of them is the fact that the Kakuna can poison you with Poison Sting. If that happens, it really helps the Scyther, because it takes a lot of turns for Fury Cutter to stack up and knock you out. All that time, Poison is slowly chipping away at you, maybe saving Scyther one turn, and that can be critical. In this case though, I don't get poisoned, I move on to the Scyther, and then I go for Charm. What I was thinking here is when Fury Cutter misses, it'll then have to stack up from a lower point of damage, and that'll give me more turns to be able to knock the Scyther out. In retrospect, this doesn't seem like a great idea because I don't have a way to force Scyther's combo to break. If I had Sing, I could forcibly break its combo and then knock it out. In this case, I can't do that, Scyther doesn't miss, and Cleffa goes down, getting its first reset of the playthrough. I tried again using the same strategy because I don't have a lot of options available to me, after all Mudslap cannot hit this flying type. In this case though, the Scyther does miss with Fury Cutter, and I got set up to minus six, so because of that I'm able to use Pound, which is doing about a quarter, however Fury Cutter can't stack up fast enough, and Scyther even goes for Quick Attack when I'm about to knock it out, so Cleffa takes the victory on its second attempt. 
There's another major battle immediately after this one. I have to face the rival in Azalea Town. He leads with Ghastly. My only option against this thing is to use Mudslap. Luckily for me, the only thing Ghastly could do to me to potentially cause a loss is use Spite and drain Mudslap's PP. Now, I'm not quite doing half. However, my second Mudslap gets a critical hit, so this isn't able to play out. He sends in Zubat next, which is outspeeding, causing a flinch on turn 1. I go for Pound, doing half, it tries to bite again, but luckily no more flinches, and I finish it off. So I still have green health left over for the Bayleaf. But I want everyone to remember that this thing is incredibly good. It sets up Reflect on turn 1, and then I realized my mistake. Right there I could have used Encore on turn 1, and then it would have either had to spam Reflect or Poison Powder, giving me a lot of free damage. Unfortunately for me, because Clef is slower, I can't use Encore now. That would just trap it in Razor Leaf, and that's what I don't want to do. I figure that it is possible for me to win with a critical hit from Pound, and maybe the Bayleaf could miss Razor Leaf. However, it brings me down to red health. Hits one more Razor Leaf, which Cleffa survives on one hit point, but I'm still not doing enough damage. Unless Razor Leaf misses at the critical moment, I hit one more pound and Bay Leaf goes down. I didn't use Mud Slap there, by the way. That was just the 5% chance that Razor Leaf had to miss. I got so lucky. I cannot believe I won that one on the first attempt. With that victory under my belt, Cleffa gets a major moveset upgrade. In the forest, I can grab the TM for Headbutt, which I teach in the place of Pound, giving me an effective power increase from 66 up to 115. Now do remember, in Generation 2, badges give extra badge boosts based on the type of the badge. So very soon, once I defeat Whitney, Headbutt is going to get another 12.5% boost to its damage. At that point, I will have three boosts for normal type moves. Faulkner's Attack Boost, the Pink Bow's Boost, and Whitney's Type Base Boost. I hope you can see why people always say that normal types are incredibly strong in Generation 2. That being said, I think that Whitney potentially could be extremely challenging, so I want to do all of the training in the surrounding region just to level up as much as is possible. I also ensure that I pick up the TM for Rollout because this move can be very powerful against her because you can set up on the Clefairy. After defeating all the gym trainers, Cleffa is now level 29. It is painfully close to level 30. I am really hoping here that I am going to level up after defeating the Clefairy. To ensure the best possible chance against Whitney, I teach Rollout in the place of Charm and now I'm ready. Whitney leads with Clefairy, and I'm going to go for a rollout right away, getting this move set up for when the mill tank comes out. The only flaw to this strategy is if rollout misses, then I won't have much damage for the mill tank. And in this case, it misses against the Clefairy, and then when I try to set it up again, it crits the Clefairy, meaning I'm going to hit mill tank with a turn 2 rollout. Well, that is if I don't miss, which is what happens right away, and as a result, Cleffa gets a quick loss here. In the next fight, I use my Bugsy strategy against the Miltank, using Charm to lower its attack stat, hoping that it will miss Rollout. In this case, though, it just refuses to miss and finishes Cleffa off quickly. I hope that everyone can see that me deleting Sing earlier on was definitely a mistake. It was key to have the ability to break combos during the Bugsy fight, as well as here against Whitney. There's one really straightforward way for me to improve Cleffa's odds here, which is just to level up to 30. I have one more quick loss against her, and then I decided to completely change my strategy. Instead of using Charm, Headbutt, or Rollout, I can use Mud Slap to lower the Mill Tank's accuracy, making it more likely for its Rollout combo to break. Against Whitney and to a lesser extent Bugsy, it really seems like the developers wanted you to understand how to combo break. They give you so many moves that can potentially do this. For example, Headbutt with a flinch chance, Mud Slap with the ability to lower accuracy, and then Dig with the ability to go underground and break the combo that way. The fact that these three TMs are all clustered around Goldenrod City really suggests to me that the developers wanted you to use them in this way. I also think the developers also kind of wanted you to go to the dark side and use for instance Fury Cutter or Rollout as a way to defeat Whitney. In this case though I think the Mud Slap strategy is a little bit more reliable for Cleffa and so after 4 resets I do manage to finally win and earn myself the badge boost for normal type moves. I was excited about that victory and I wanted to save as much time as possible and get to Ecritique City so of course I don't backtrack to the Goldenrod City Pokemon Center. And of course, I do one of my typical misplays, which is just to fight the pseudo without healing. Now if you were doing this solo run, I'd recommend just running away at this point, because I have red health, and I am probably not going to be able to defeat it. 
but in all my first playthroughs, I require myself to knock it out. I just think things are a little bit more fun this way. After all, Pokemon are never ranked in my tier list based on these first results, so it doesn't really matter. In this case, though, it does cause a reset because the Sudowoodo knows low kick. After healing, Cleffa doesn't have any problems here, so next let's face the Kimono Girls. They give great experience yields, and there's no fighting type evolution, so there's no type advantage over Cleffa here. By the way, that's why I think the fairy type would have been special in Generation 2. All of the evolutions that are currently in existence have types that were initially special when they were introduced. The only exception is Sylveon, which of course is a fairy type, and this typing hadn't been introduced when type still determined damage category. By the way, the only special type from the original games that we still do not have an evolution for is the dragon type, so it sort of feels like the fairy type took the place of the dragon type evolution that they may have made. I really hope that one day we get Drakion. I think it would be so cool. In my first playthroughs, Hidden Power is banned, so I head to the Lighthouse next, doing a lot of additional training. And this is very important, because coming up next is a fight against Morty, and the best move I have against Ghosts currently on Cleffa's set is Mud Slap. After concluding the training at the Lighthouse, Cleffa's level 37, the fast growth rate is really starting to come in handy. I teleport back to Akriti City, and then I face the rival in Burned Tower. Up first is Haunter. Now this thing loves to curse you on turn one, which is really annoying. Luckily for me though, I'm over leveled and I get a critical hit. So Mudslap finishes it off and I take no damage on the first turn. Next is Magnemite and four times damage from Mudslap takes it out in a single turn. Headbutt one shots the Zubat. And so I've made it to the Bayleaf with full health. Because it sees that Razor Leaf is not going to be able to get a KO, it prioritizes setup instead, in this case choosing Poison Powder, which is the perfect move for it to go for. It didn't set up Reflect, meaning Headbot is doing maximum damage, and I am able to two hit. Alright, so let's head into Morty's gym. Now we need to see how the ghosts are going to be. And in this case, against the first trainer in the gym with his level 16 Gastlys. Cleffa is not able to one hit with Mud Slap. That is really not a good sign. I do manage to defeat all the trainers here, but I figured that I needed a little bit more experience. So instead, I'm going to head through Mount Mortar towards the Lake of Rage to do additional training. On the way, I want to draw your attention to one trainer. He's this guy. Before I battle him, I am going to teach Cleffa Return in the place of Charm. This is going to really improve its damage ranges, and I want this move before this fight because he has both of the Nidos. In this case, they know Double Kick, which is super effective against me, so I just wanted to ensure that I would get one hits there. I'm fighting him specifically because he has really good experience yields because his Pokemon are fully evolved. After that, towards the Lake of Rage, I clear out all the trainers, leveling Cleffa up to 40. And now, with pretty much every trainer in the region defeated, let's head back to Morty and see how this goes. I went into this fight seeing if I could do it with Mud Slap. I figured that with accuracy lowing and the fact that the first Ghastly is going to knock itself out with Curse might give me the win. Mud Slap is able to two hit his second Pokemon, Haunter, and they do move on to the Gengar. It burns my Mint Berry right away with Hypnosis. Mud Slap does what looks like a third. I hit it again, taking it to orange. It misses Hypnosis, but my next Mud Slap doesn't knock it out. It survives with a sliver. As a result, Curse Damage takes Cleffa down to two hit points. And then Morty goes for Hypnosis again, causing sleep, and Cleffa goes down. Watching this footage is actually particularly painful to me. The obvious solution here is just to use Rollout against Morty. By far, this would be better than Mudslap, and I would definitely be able to get a win without doing this training against wild Pokemon. I go back at level 43 and try again, but I'm still not able to defeat him, and I continue training all the way to 45. At this level, now Mudslap is able to one-hit the Ghastly and two-hit the Haunter, so I take no curse damage before the Gengar comes out. With the higher level, I'm able to 3-shot it, and as a result, I do win against Morty here. Now if you're used to playing modern Pokemon games, you'll probably think that I have just received my first special type move in the form of Shadow Ball. But no, in Generation 1, 2, and 3, ghost type moves all deal physical damage, which makes absolutely no sense. And it also really messes me up, because I am used to playing modern Pokemon games, and I have always thought of Shadow Ball as a special move. Plus, it really seems intuitively like the ghost type should deal special damage. By the way, I do know that in Pokemon Legacy Crystal, they have made it so that the dark type is physical and the ghost type is special. That makes so much more sense. After all, the dark type moves are things like Bite and Crunch. They really sound like they're physical. If you're wondering if I'm going to play that game on the channel, 
I am, however, I'm not rushing into it. You'll probably see it sometime over the next year or two. At this point in the run, I have to make a critical choice with Cleffa. That is the safe route going to price, or to head to Chuck and be a little bit more risky, but have potentially more upside. In this case, since Cleffa is really starting to level up quickly, and there are a lot of trainers at sea, I am going to go towards Chuck, because if I can defeat him, I gain access to Fly, which really speeds the mid game up. After completing my training at sea, Cleffa is level 48. Now, I want to make a comparison here with my Togepi run. Because of the ordering I did things in, I went to Price first with Togepi, and then I ended up skipping a bunch of the trainers at sea instead and just heading straight into the gym. I actually arrived here at a slightly lower level. That being said, in both cases, completely unplanned. I have exactly 57 speed going into the battle against Black Belt Yoshi. This is incredibly convenient for me because the Hitmonlee has 56 speed. With Cleffa conveniently moving first, I'm able to hit return and knock it out in a single hit. The next guy, Black Belt Lao, is not nearly as difficult. He only has a Hitmonchan with no fighting type moves. Also, return just one hits as well. Black Belt Knob is the final scary trainer in the gym. He has a Machoke, but in this case, once again, return one hits. So, I have made it to Chuck. Let's see how Cleffa can do. First on his team is Primeape, it moves first using Leer lowering my defense, and then return one hits. Because of the defense drop, I think that this fight is over if the Polyrath hits Dynamic Punch, but Cleffa is faster so I'm able to hit with return, and then I dodge a Hypnosis and finish Chuck off. Outside of the gym, I talked to the character who I have realized now is Chuck's wife. I had no idea that she was supposed to be his wife for the longest time. I never clued into the fact that she says that her husband lost the player. I was always just really focused on the fact that she is calling him chubby. Poor Chuck, he really can't do anything right. Even hitting hypnosis when he has Mind Reader on the field, in fact. Also, if Chuck was a YouTuber, he would be like the most hated Poketuber of all time. Think about the strategies that he uses. Like, I think the Dynamic Punch is a great move, and I'm going to use it in combo with Hypnosis. Yeah, everyone would really love that in the comments section. With Chuck finished, I have to complete the Rocket plotline, which is really boring. It takes Clef up to level 52, I grind against the trainers in Price's gym, and then, at level 53, I take him on. For this fight, you'll notice I taught Clef a Shadow Ball. If you're confused about its effective power being 90, this is because Morty's badge gives a 12.5% boost to Ghost-type damage. I always forget about that boost when I gain access to Shadow Ball, so it is a little bit more useful than base 80 power suggests. I added it to my set here, mostly just because I had forgotten about it. It isn't actually relevant against Price at all. I just spam Return, take an easy victory, and with him out of the way, Jasmine is next. To prepare, I head to Goldenrod City, I surf south, and I'm doing this specifically so I can pick up an extra nugget. Then I head to the game corner to see how many coins I can purchase. In this case, I'm able to buy 4,000, and I will need 1,500 more in order to buy Fire Blast. So I head back to the department store to sell a bunch of items. By the way, note here that I am selling a protein that I picked up in the rocket plotline. This is because Fire Blast will be far more useful than this one individual vitamin. Even after all this selling, I still don't have enough money to get all the coins that I need, so I end up gambling for a little bit, and this doesn't go particularly well for me. I waste what feels like a lot of time, end up going back to the department store after winning a little bit. I sell some items, come back, buy the coins I need, and now at long last, I gain access to Fire Blast, which I teach over Headbutt. An alternative strategy would have been to use Icy Wind against the Steelix and Mudslap for the Magnemites, but Mudslap's damage ranges really aren't that good. Cleffa only has an 18.61% chance to knock out the Magnemites in a single hit. As a result, it goes without saying the Fire Blast strategy is going to be far more consistent, so let's see how this fight goes. For to have the Paralyzed Cureberry, this is just in case I miss against the Magnemite. It doesn't, and I finish it in one turn. Next, she sends in her second Magnemite. Here I do miss, it goes for Thunderbolt, so I don't get paralyzed either way, and I finish it on the next turn. Last is Steelix, I hit with Fire Blast, and I get the one hit. By the way, I have just now noticed something. Fire Blast has 85% accuracy, Hydro Pump has 80% accuracy, and Blizzard has 70% accuracy. I don't know how I never noticed that these moves all didn't have 70% accuracy in Generation 2 and beyond. I thought that they only had different accuracies in Generation 1. 
That being said, why is Fire Blast 85% accuracy? It has a 10% chance to inflict a burn in Generation 2, whereas Hydro Pump with less accuracy has no secondary effect. Honestly, I find that really weird. It makes sense that they dropped Blizzard's accuracy to 70% because Freeze is so incredible, and overall, Ice-type is just fantastic offensively. It's a bit strange that they didn't change Fire Blast to 80% accuracy and Hydro Pump to 85% accuracy. I think that that is the thing that makes the most sense. Maybe I'm just underestimating how good Water is as an offensive typing. That being said, for solo challenges, I think I prefer Fire type and Ice type moves over Water type moves. And Ice type moves are immediately going to be useful after I clear out the Rocket plotline. By the way, both Petrol and the Rival are not problems at all. I do get to use Shadow Ball for the first time, which is really nice, but overall this move is not that relevant for this playthrough. After concluding the Rocket Tower, I head to Ice Path where I pick up the Nevermelt Ice, and you'll notice now that I've taught Cleffa Icy Wind. The cruel irony about this move and why I use Hidden Power Ice so frequently in my solo challenges is that it has 95% accuracy, and even after the same type attack bonus, and if it had the Nevermelt Ice, Return would still be stronger against Claire's Dragonairs. So let's see how Cleffa did against her in my first playthrough. Dragonair number one is a one hit with Return, and so the second one as well as the third one are also one hits. I have made it to the Kingdra, and it looks like I've taken some damage, but I actually just didn't heal to full before this fight, because I knew it would be completely trivial. Return takes the Kingdra down to red health, and then she uses a Hyper Potion, delaying things for me. The Kingdra even goes for Hyper Beam, but it doesn't do very much, and I finish it off. Do note now that after this fight, Cleffa is level 62. The fast growth rate is really starting to help out. Just outside the Blackthorn Gym, I talk to this guy and grab the spell tag. This is going to be useful to boost Shadow Ball's damage, especially because Will is the next major battle coming up in the run. I say next major battle because yes, I do have to face the rival, but he leads with a Sneasel, which is one of the worst Generation 2 Pokemon. The only loss condition is the Magneton paralyzing you, and I have Fire Blast, so I just one-shot it. Shadow Ball takes the Haunter route, as well as the Kadabra, and Fire Blast uh, would one-hit the Meganium if it actually hit. It just misses, it uses Poison Powder and misses itself, and I finish it on the next turn. So with that, Kalefa is ready for the League. Wheel is first. I go for Shadow Ball on the initial Zatu and knock it out in a single hit. Okay good, the spell tag is doing its job. Next is Jinx. Now my speed is a bit of an issue here because his Pokemon are moving first, so he's been able to get two Psychics in by the time the Jinx goes down. Next is Executor. This thing is slow, so I get to hit Shadow Ball first, but it is bulky so it survives and sets up Reflect, which means that Shadow Ball is now going to be dealing less damage. By the way, I have been thinking about adding to the overlay a feature where if the enemy uses Reflect it will cut the effective power power of all physical moves in the moveset area of the screen in the top left. With my release schedule over the next couple months, I probably won't have time to do that until the new year, but don't worry, I'm thinking about it, it will happen eventually. Next, Will sends in Slowbro. This thing usually loves to set up a lot, and it does that in this case, so I finish it over three turns, taking no damage. All that's left now is his ace, Zatu. It goes for Confuse Ray right away, but Cleffa doesn't hit itself, Shadow Ball connects, and the Zatu goes down. So, I've made it to Koga. This one's gonna be really easy. I have Return and Fire Blast. That's basically everything I need for his entire team. By the way, I want to note here that I still have Icy Wind on my set. I need to hang on to it until I get to Lance because it will be useful there. But up until this point in the run, it has done nothing. It is literally just dead weight. Watching the footage back makes me painfully aware of the fact that teaching this move later on would have been the better choice. After all, I could have kept something useful on my set, like what about Sing? I'm sure everyone would have loved that. As I said before, Koga is very easy, so let's now move on to the Bruno fight. Of all of the League members, I think that he is most likely to give Cleffa problems. What I am really counting on here is the fact that Return is going to be dealing significant damage. And it is, but Hitmonlee is 4 speed faster than Cleffa, so it's able to deal damage with Double Kick before I knock it out. The consequence of this is that then Hitmonchan comes out, uses Priority Mock Punch to take me down to Orange Health, and now I think the only chance that I have of winning is either a critical hit or Machamp missing cross chop. I go for return, it takes the Machamp to orange health, 
it hits Cross Chop, and Cleffa goes down. Alright, I have to use Rare Candies here so that I outspeed the Hitmonlee. I do not want to have to bank on a miss or a crit. I use all seven that I've collected to this point in the run to take Cleffa up to level 74. Now it has enough speed to make it to the Hitmonchan without taking any damage. There is no way to prevent the Mach Punch, but I have a much better chance of surviving Cross Chop now. Also, Return has a better damage range, but it still doesn't look like it's quite enough. Machamp hits Cross Chop, and Cleffa does not survive okay because of a critical hit. That's frustrating. So we do need to wait till the Machamp doesn't get a crit. Since I'm two-hitting the Machamp anyways, I figured maybe go for Fire Blast to potentially burn. It doesn't cause the status condition. I survive Cross Chop this time because it didn't crit, and as a result, I am able to move on to the Onyx. This is the first Pokemon that Icy Wind is useful against. I hate to say it, but the Onyx probably would have knocked Cleffa out if I did not one-hit, so I guess I'm happy that I have Icy Wind for this fight. Still, I could probably just one-hit the Onyx with Fire Blast anyways. Onyx is really not a good Pokemon. But you know who is good? Karen. She leads with an Umbreon, and this thing is just so awful because it loves to use Sand Attack, which is what it does here. Clef has enough damage to knock it out in two hits, move on to the Vile Plume. However, here I miss, and then I get paralyzed with Stun Spore. All right. That's pretty bad. I miss a lot of Fire Blasts, not even because of Paralysis, just because Fire Blast now has a 63% chance to hit. I'm sure that you all can tell this is going to be a loss. Gengar curses me, Shadow Ball does knock it out. I make it to the Murkrow, finishing it off, and I get to the Houndoom, but it's essentially just a time waste. It knocks Cleffa out, and I have to start the fight all over again. Once again, my accuracy is lowered, but this time Fire Blast comes through and knocks the Vile Plume out, preventing Paralysis. While Gengar outspeeds with Curse, I knock it out with the follow-up Shadow Ball, and as a result, I can finish off the Murkrow, taking only a little bit of damage from Faint Attack, and move on to the Houndoom with green health. Flamethrower doesn't do that much, because Cleffa has decent special defense for a baby Pokemon, and with that I strike with Return, and Houndoom goes down to a single hit. So now I am ready to take on the champion. For Cleffa, I think that Lance is going to be quite simple. I was expecting to two hit the Gyarados, but he had a lucky critical hit, finishing it in a single turn. Next, he starts to send in his Dragonites, which I one hit with Icy Wind, luckily connecting in both cases, preventing Thunder Wave entirely. Then Aerodactyl comes out, he does outspeed, but it misses Rock Slide, and Icy Wind finishes it in a single turn. For Charizard, the best choice is Return. I tank Flamethrower easily and knock it out. There's only one Pokemon left now. It is his final Dragonite, which does outspeed by three points. It hits Hyper Beam, Cleffa shrugs it off, and with that, it has finished the Elite Four with a time of 1 hour 54 minutes and 14 seconds, with 11 resets at level 76. If I had to summarize this section of the game, I would say that most of it comes down to player error and major mistakes that I was making with how I played Cleffa. A time under 2 hours at Lance is not very good overall for a Johto playthrough, and in comparison with great babies like Alekid and Magby, it is also starting to lag behind significantly. Luckily for it, the next section of the game is very simple. All of the first 7 Kanto gym leaders cause no problems for Cleffa, and I make it all the way to blue. For this fight, I am sticking with the same set that I was using in the League. I use Return to knock out the Pidgeot in two hits, and then Shadow Ball to two-shot the Alakazam. I was hoping that Icy Wind would one-shot the Rhydon, but it doesn't. It sets up Sandstorm, and then my next turn misses, allowing it to use Earthquake, doing massive damage. Because of that, I'm on low health for the Gyarados, and it is able to finish Cleffa with Hyper Beam. I try again, hoping to roll better damage against the Rhydon, but still, it is just barely not a one-hit. This time, I managed to take out the Gyarados. Next is Executor. By the way, it might look like I should be going for Shadow Ball here because it has higher effective power, but Fire Blast is doing much more damage, just because Executor has more physical defense, and Cleffa has less physical attack. Still, it's not enough to one-hit, allowing the Executor to use one Egg Bomb before I knock it out. The final Pokemon is Arcanine. It's fast, it hits a Flamethrower, taking me to red. Return doesn't do enough, and as a result, Cleffa goes down again. I started to consider using Curse on my set at this point, but I figured something else out that could potentially give me green health for the Arcanine. And that is, if I use Icy Wind on the first turn against the Gyarados, I am going to lower its speed and do chip damage. What this allows me to do is take it to red health on the next turn, meaning Blue is going to start using full restores against it. When he does this, it buys me a lot more turns for the leftovers to stack up, 
recovering a lot of health. As a result, I'm able to move on to the Executor, which will get another full restore, and this brings me up to nearly full health by the time the Arcanine comes out. And uh, yeah, then it just goes for Flamethrower and Burns Cleffa, cutting my attack stat, and as a result, I get another loss. So while that is frustrating, the strategy ends up working out in the next fight, and Arcanine goes down. With that, it is time to prepare for Red. I do some training against Wild Pokémon to get up to level 84, and then I use my final rare candy, boosting Cleffa up to level 85. Okay, Red, let's go. I started my attempts off here very optimistic, trying the same set that I used against Blue. I can one-shot the Pikachu with Return, then against Espeon, I use Shadow Ball for super effective damage, however the Psychic type is able to set up Reflect first, and Shadow Ball isn't able to do half after that. This results in Espeon dealing massive damage with Psychic, and on the second turn it uses the move, it crits, so Cleffa goes down. I tried again, but this time I realized that my outcome is even worse against the Pikachu, because it outspeeds, and he uses Charm, once my attack stat is cut, I have basically no more chance left in the fight. So for the third battle, it is time to put all of the Johto flavor in place. I've taught Curse, as well as Rest, and I'm going to run these two moves in combination with Return, as well as Shadow Ball. Against the Pikachu I can set up, because Cleffa's special defense is actually decent. There are of course flaws to this strategy, I can get paralyzed and then fail to heal with Rest over and over. As a result, the Pikachu knocks me out. But that isn't going to happen in every fight. In the next one, I'm able to get fully set up and knock the Pikachu out with Return. The Espeon is next because I have high health, it goes for Reflect, and I'm able to knock it out with Shadow Ball. Okay, Snorlax time. This thing is going to go for Amnesia first turn because I have a lot of health and high physical defense. Because of Reflect, it survives Return, it gets one Body Slam in, luckily not critting, and I take it out. The Venusaur that follows goes for an unfortunate move, Sunny Day, which is going to boost the power of Charizard, who is probably going to come out next. And then a very rare occurrence happens. The Venusaur starts using Synthesis to heal when I attack it with Return. It goes for this move long enough that Reflect wears out, I hit with Return, and finish it off. That also stalled out the Sun, however, not quite enough, the Charizard still is able to get a boosted Flamethrower in, and it takes Cleffa down to orange health. I am not liking my chances anymore, the Blastoise is probably going to knock me out right away. Because of the Sun, it chooses Blizzard, but Cleffa survives, hits Return, and Red is defeated. In its first playthrough, Cleffa gets a result of 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds, with 17 resets at level 85. This is a game time of 8 hours and 24 minutes. When compared with the three last babies, Magby, Smoochum, and Alekid, Cleffa has a lot to improve in its second run. Actually, so much so that I did a second run, and I was very underwhelmed with the results. I don't think that I optimized it well enough, so I came back and did a third one. And I have to mention here that this process with Cleffa was incredibly painful. I started this third run over and over and over again, because Cleffa is pretty weak, and if you're not playing extremely carefully and healing before all of the fights, sometimes, just sometimes, you'll get a random reset against a rocket in Slowpoke Well, or something like that, and then the whole run is basically invalid because your last save was Faulkner, and blacking out is going to take a bunch of time. I try to hold myself to a high standard for these follow-up playthroughs in all my videos. I really want to do the best that I can with every single Pokemon. That being said, there are some mistakes that eventually I just do have to make peace with. It is basically impossible to do a run with no mistakes. That happens like once in a blue moon. It is very rare. If you've ever done a solo challenge yourself or like a Nuzlocke, you will recognize that. We're all human, we make mistakes, and then when we don't make mistakes, the RNG just decides to be awful and ruin our perfect playthrough anyways. In Cleffa's second playthrough, I was able to get a final time of 2 hours, 7 minutes, and 36 seconds. While this is a major improvement over its first playthrough, I had 21 resets, so I improved a lot of things, and I made a whole bunch of other stuff really inconsistent. And that is the main reason that I came back to do this one again. It just didn't feel like it was in the place it needed to be in terms of consistency. So let's talk about all the choices I made and see if I was able to get a better result than I was in my second run. 
In the early game, I make the obvious choice, which I talked about in the first playthrough. I keep Sing, and I get rid of Encore. The first fight where this is really relevant is against Bugsy. Now I have a definitive way to break the combo when Scyther uses Fury Cutter. However, there is an even better way to play this fight. As soon as the Scyther comes out, I'm going to use Sing to put it to sleep. Once it goes to sleep, then I can use Charm to cut its attack, so that when it starts using Fury Cutter, it's going to do even less damage. After that, I'm going to go for Pound and knock it out. In this case, it sleeps for a while, uses Quick Attack when it wakes up, doing not very much, and I take a first attempt victory. Now, Sing makes Bugsy more consistent, and it also should make the rival a little bit more consistent. I am no longer relying on a 5% chance for Razor Leaf to miss, or just spamming Mud Slap and praying. In this case, I can put the Bay Leaf to sleep with Sing and then knock it out with Pound. Of course, you're going to complain, Sing is not that consistent. I know, it's a bad move. Like, it's the best thing that Cleffa has at this point. You can use Sing, put the Bay Leaf to sleep, and then stack up Mud Slaps if you really want, but I think that this just burns more time than it's worth. I personally prefer going for Sing right away, put it to sleep, and then knock it out with Pound. In this case, I do have a single reset here, but I was expecting at least one. I do want to note the fact that I am holding a Poison Cure Berry here. I failed an entire run because I didn't have a Poison Cure Berry in this fight. You really need it in case the Bay Leaf goes for Poison Powder. Being poisoned is unacceptable when you're doing very little damage with Pound each turn. The next major battle is against Whitney, and here, once again, Sing can potentially help. In this case, I flinch the Clefairy and knock it out for free. Then Miltank goes for rollout. However, at level 30, I figured out that you can just spam Headbutt and you will be able to finish the Miltank off before it gets you if you're using the pink bow. So overall, this fight is much more consistent than the former two, and I move on with still only one reset. And now is where everything changes for this run because I have access to Hidden Power. And in this case, I think that it makes sense to go with Hidden Power Psychic. The DVs for this are 15 attack, 12 defense, and 11 HP. In this case, the loss of defense and HP are both acceptable because this makes Morty so much easier. Plus, it gives Clefable access to a special move earlier on into the run. Now, it's fair to think that this move is going to be very helpful against Chuck as well as Bruno. However, that's not really the case. I'm going to talk about those trainers in a little bit because for now, Clef is headed towards Price. The reason I'm going to fight him first is just because in follow-up playthroughs, I really struggled with Chuck and had a lot of resets there. I need far more consistency against him, and the little bit of time that I bleed backtracking through the center of the map is really worth it. My goal for this fight is to be level 50. I could level up a little bit more and get an outspeed on the Primeape, but overall that isn't really consequential. Hidden Power has a one hit against it, and then Hidden Power is going to two hit the Polyrath. Now I did mention that this isn't really going to help this fight, and that is because Return is exactly the same. It one hits the Primeape, and it two hits the Polyrath. Hidden Power does do a little bit more damage overall, but the number of turns to KO is exactly the same. In this case, I take a first attempt victory over Chuck, so still only one reset. From there, I have ensured that I have enough money to buy Fire Blast so I don't have to waste time gambling, and I can use the powerful Fire-type move to defeat Jasmine with ease. Of course, for Claire, who is next, I do not teach Icy Wind. It is not required to defeat her team. And with her out of the way, I make my first major change. In my second playthrough, I tried to save levels because I didn't need them for the red fight at the end of the game. However, that caused a really awful situation where I got to Lance with less than optimal speed. So many of his Pokemon were moving first, and as a result, even with Icy Wind, I was not able to defeat him easily. This gave me critical insight into the fact that it is a speed problem against Lance, so I need to grind with Cleffa now before the league to get it up to level 68, and then I can use 7 rare candies to bring it up to level 75. First of all, this helps against all the League members because I'm at a high level. Will and Koga are of course no problems at all. Then against Bruno, we can talk about Hidden Power. It's only useful against the Onyx, which is really sad. By the way, Fire Blast has a 62.62% chance to knock out. Hidden Power has a guaranteed one hit, so that is its only utility in this fight. You might think, isn't Hidden Power better against the Machamp? And the answer is no. Return actually has a 31% chance to one hit, whereas Hidden Power will only one hit if it gets a crit. What this fight really comes down to is damage ranges, you need to be able to survive a mock punch as well as one non-crit cross chop. In this case I have no resets against Bruno, however against Karen because of accuracy I do lose once, but I win on my second attempt. 
From there, going into the Lance fight, I am level 77. This ensures the outspeed, by one speed I will note, on the final Dragonite. As a result, the only two Pokemon that are going to do damage to me are the Aerodactyl, as well as the Charizard. With Icy Wind in the place of Mudslap, Cluffet takes an easy victory, and steamrolls its way through Kanto, arriving at Blue. You'll note here that I've upgraded Hidden Power to Psychic. Um, that's a confusing sentence, I realize. I had Hidden Power Psychic, and now I have the move Psychic. It's really annoying that this is a move why didn't they call it like i don't know like mind attack or something they should have called it something else i feel like psychic is just a terrible move name especially when it shares a name with a type like what if there was a move that was just called ghost wouldn't that be annoying or a move that was called ice like ah anyways now that i have psychic this means that i can hit the ride on and consistently two shot it this prevents me from losing in the case that icy wind would miss by the way psychic actually has a higher percent chance to one hit the ride on when compared with icy wind and that is just because of accuracy psychic also has a 100 percent chance to two hit whereas icy wind has a 91 percent chance to two hit with blue defeated red is last this fight i'm gonna play the exact same way i played in my first playthrough overall i think this gives cleffa the highest chance to win at the lowest possible level, saving the most real time, giving me good risk versus reward. And in this case, I win on my first attempt, clocking in with a final Cleffa time of 1 hour 58 minutes and 1 second, with two resets at level 86. This is a game time of 7 hours and 37 minutes. Overall, I think that my expectations for Cleffa were a little bit too high. As a result, I come away from this run with a little bit of disappointment. I think I thought that its move pool was just going to carry it a little bit more. But the real problem here is that its stats are just really not good, and it doesn't gain access to reliable special damage until later into the playthrough. Plus, it doesn't even want to be using special moves because return is just doing more damage. If you swap this thing's special attack and physical attack, I expect that it would put out a performance similar to a Lekid and Mag be. But as things are, Cleffa was not very good. In this video, I'm not going to do an in-depth comparison with Cleffa against all of the other babies. We'll save that for a future video. For now, let's just place it in my overall tier list. With its final time, it just barely squeezes into the E tier, earning the spot behind Fampy. So that's it for episode 6. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're enjoying this series. If you support me on YouTube through memberships or on Patreon, thank you so much. It means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in tomorrow's video when I take on Pokemon Crystal with only an Iggly buff.